One, two. That's okay. Sound like it's good. All right. I'm going to stand into the light and get blinded for the next couple of minutes. Um, you're very welcome to the first episode of Binge Watch Academy Superhero Science. So you're probably all wondering, sitting there in the auditorium, thinking, what is Binge Watch Academy Superhero Science? Well, to be honest, this is a brainchild of Yannick who's in the front seat. Um, there he's waving from Studio Generale, who approached me a few months ago and had this idea for this series of talks that could be related to popular culture, in particular to the fact that we are addicted to binge watching and we absolutely love it. I do. Uh, recently binge watched Titans. Anyone seen the Titans series DC on Netflix? Yeah, so I just binge watched that. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about what to expect over the next few weeks because this is not a one off, this is the first of four nights about superheroes, about science, and about binge watching. So this is the breakdown of the talks. First of all, we're gonna to have tonight, which is about Superman and Luke Cage. Then we have episode number two, which is gonna be on in April, on April 2nd, and in that we're gonna talk about Jessica Jones and the X-Men, and we're gonna be looking at genetic engineering. The third talk is on the 25th of April. That's gonna be about Supergirl and the Flash, and the main topic there is gonna be about speed. Gonna talk about how fast you can go, all the things you gotta be thinking about then, and the last one, episode four, is going to be about Daredevil and Augmented Senses. Now, all of these episodes, part of Binge Watch Academy, are all going to take place right here, same venue, same time, 7.30 to 9, on each of those particular dates. Now, not only do we have the talk series, but we also have a podcast. So I just started a podcast, which is called Binge Watch Academy Superhero Science. I have some of the links up here. It's gone to iTunes for approval. Can you believe iTunes rejected the podcast because my artwork was 1,416 1, pixels by 1,400 instead of 1,400 by 1,400? Please bring more humans into the decision-making um, arguments there, Apple, please. I'm going to put it up on Spotify, but you can also uh, listen to it on the website, bwscience.com forward slash podcast, and you can find the links and the podcast details right there. And I also want people to spread the word about this. We want to get people to be talking about Binge Watch Academy because this isn't going to be your run-of-the-mill typical talk series where people just come along and talk and then do then there's questions and then we have another talk. No, we want to have this as an interactive set of episodes where everyone is taking part in some way. And you'll see tonight that you're all going to be taking part, not just in answering, uh, asking questions for the speakers, but also in another way, and I'll show you that in a few moments. So if anyone is online or doing anything like that now, it would be great if you could start following BW Science, that's actually me, um, so if you can follow me, that'd be great. But also Studio Generale Delft, and also on Instagram, BW Science, and if you're posting photos or anything, it'd be great if you use the hashtags just to spread the word about what we're doing here with Binge Watch Academy and what it is all about. So who am I? So my name is Barry Fitzgerald, I'm a research scientist, and I am a superhero fanatic. I am um, addicted to the superhero genre, and I frequently binge watch this content, as I mentioned at the start, binge watching Titans, for example. This is a photo taken of me back in 2016. It was after I published my first book, which is called The Secret to Superhero Science. And in that book, I talk about the real science you would do at school, and current scientific research being done around the world that could lead to the emergence of superpowers in the future. And that's where everything has kickstarted for me, because it's gone from writing a book to starting a journal. So I have a journal here at TU Delft, which is called Superhero Science and Technology, fully open access and fully, uh, fully free to read. And I've also published a number of scientific papers and gone on then to, well, arrange events such as this one that you're all part of here tonight and to witness. So why am I interested in superpowers and superheroes? Uh, well, I think that probably most people who've come here tonight um, want a superpower, right? Everybody here wants a superpower, yeah? At least one, I want, I want a few. But at this stage, I want a few. But when I was five years old, I saw Superman fly through Metropolis, and I wanted to be able to fly. And that's the moment that I thought, I want superpowers. Still can't do it, still can't fly under my own, uh, with, without having to wear, uh, for example, an Iron Man suit, that doesn't exist either. So unless I have to get into a plane, I can't fly. Um, but I still dream about it, and ever since I saw that particular film, I was hooked and addicted to those particular, to this genre, the superior genre, the possibilities, because it's not about things that are impossible for me, it's about things that could be possible. And that's what we see in these films, things that could be possible. 
And there are going to be a whole bunch of superhero films coming out this year, and there have been a whole bunch in the past. I'm going to talk a little bit about them in a few moments. But this year, well, we've already had Glass, if anyone has seen that. How many people have seen Captain Marvel? Okay, that's about half the room. How many people have seen Captain Marvel more than once? Okay, there we go. Me. Oh, no, there's two people. That's okay, I'm not alone. Um, how many of you have seen more than twice? It's okay. That's okay, it's good. So, the next film that's coming out is Shazam. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that character later on in one of the interludes between the talks. That poster you see behind me was just released today for Avengers Endgame um, because a brand new trailer for Avengers Endgame just dropped. And you may, may or may not see that tonight. More than likely you will. And the last one is for X-Men Dark Phoenix, which is going to be out in June, and a trailer for that dropped last week. So these films are going to keep on coming, and there are a bunch of other ones that, of course, I can't go here and talk about them. But, uh, for example, there's the Joker film, there's Hellboy, and there's a whole lot more hopefully coming in the future. This is the list of the top 20 highest grossing films of all time. And on this list, there are seven superhero films. There are, in fact, four of them are in the top 10. And up until recently, Aquaman wasn't there, and it was actually Captain America Civil War. Now, I was really disappointed when Captain America Civil War vanished from the top 20 highest grossing films of all time, uh, because I didn't like Aquaman. Uh, well, that's everyone's entitled to their opinion. I preferred Civil War. And these films that you see here, the ones with stars, I've seen a lot of these films a lot of times. So just to give you an idea, I've seen Avengers Infinity War, the highest grossing superhero film of all time, more than 45 times. I watch it on my phone, I watch it on my laptop, when I'm on the train, I was watching it today in the office while I was at work. Um, I have seen The Avengers from 2012 more than, I'm gonna say 65, could be 70 times at this stage. I can even tell you the dialogue as they're talking. And I, anal I analyze dialogue. I just analyze scenes, I analyze what they're saying because that's what the level I go to. Um, but there's a whole bunch of films in this list I've never seen. So I balance everything out. It's good to balance things, right? So I've never seen um, Minions, never seen Frozen, never seen um, Harry Potter or any Harry Potter film. There you go, because that's the one that always gets people straight away. Can't believe you've never seen Harry Potter. And last but not least, right up there at the top of the list, I've never seen, no, I have seen Avatar. I've never seen Titanic. I will never watch Titanic because the boat sinks the end by, okay? That's it, right? That's a massive spoiler alert. So, I, I don't wanna, I, that's why I won't watch the film. So, being part of Binge Watch Academy means that there's assignments. Don't worry, these are fun assignments. These aren't like gonna be grades that are gonna decide your future, or where you're gonna be with your career. This is all fun. So what we're gonna do is, and I hope this works because this is the first time we're gonna try it, and we're gonna sort out all the bugs, is we're gonna do live questions. And everyone's gonna vote live on your phone, and then the answers are gonna come through on the screen. That's what I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. Okay, so everyone can take out their phone if you have your phone and vote on these questions. So let's go with the first one. It's loading, here is the first question. This is just to kickstart things, and it already has an answer because I've actually put an answer in just to test it out. So the question is, Wonder Woman is part of which superhero group? So what you need to do to answer the question is you need to log in up here to that address, and then you'll be presented with this question. Select an option, press submit, and once everyone has submitted an answer, hopefully this thing should, has anyone submitted an answer already? You submitted an answer, hasn't changed. So what I'll do is I'll go back, go forward, because then it will change. See, now, okay, let's keep the votes coming in. If you don't have a phone, it's okay. Have you, has everyone on stage voted? All speakers have voted? Yeah, okay, great. Has everybody voted? Everyone's finished? Okay, so I have to go back and reload it. This is something I'll work out for the next one. So here we go. Wow, that is, yeah, pretty um, clear. Obviously, you might've got a little bit of a clue from the first vote, because that was my kind of seed vote. And those 43 people who have voted for the Justice League are absolutely correct. So she's definitely not part of the Avengers, and she's not part of all the Defenders or the Legends of Tomorrow. Right, 
You like that? Let's do another question. Okay, so Avengers Endgame is coming out. This is kind of a survey just to see what films people have seen. Here are the three previous Avengers films. I want you to log in. It's a different login. Just keep that in mind. Um, different, uh, different ending to it. So you want to log in and you can select as many of them as you want. There's no right or wrong answer here. This is a survey. It looks like some of the answers are actually going through. Wow, okay. Three, four, five. Look, that's just cool, right? We're getting it live. So if you look up, you see the answers coming through live. Um, Thirty-two, thirty-two responses. Thirty-three, thirty-four. Okay, this is great. Has everyone voted? There's still some people voting, I think. Yeah. So this one did work with the live voting. And yeah, there's still people voting. This are people still submit votes? I think that's it. So we have, oh, there's another one. Um, neck and neck, the Avengers of Age of Ultron. I'm gonna, if I add my name in here, obviously, I've seen all of these as well. So it's 43, 43, 38. Um, Infinity War, um, well, I might be talking about Infinity War later on, so, um, or making reference to it. So if you haven't seen it, just, just do that or this, okay? Um, so I might give, because particularly with something I'll show you later on. Really interesting. It's great to see that most people here have seen the Avengers films. I've, you're the right audience then for this. Great. Awesome. Last question is this, before we do other questions later on. Which superhero film are you most looking forward to seeing this year? So is it Avengers Endgame, Shazam, X-Men Dark Phoenix, or another superhero film that I haven't put on the list? So it's a different login again. My apologies for that. Just keep in mind that it's a different extension different end after that, the slash. So you can only pick one. So are people voting? Yeah, yeah. so this one isn't working. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back, go forward. And there we go. <laughs> 48 people have already voted, everyone's voted. Um, yeah, pretty unanimous there. 30 people here looking forward to Avengers Endgame. For the five people who voted for other films, which other superhero films are those that you want to see or see? Yeah? Third Ant Man. I don't think it's coming out this year. It would be great if it was, but it's not, unfortunately. Any other films? Does anyone, did anyone vote for any other film that I hadn't put on the list? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, it's got to the superhero. <laughs> I think superheroes help people, not destroy cities, right? Okay? Although the Avengers did a pretty good job of it in, uh, in, in, in 2012 Avengers, right? But that was with the help of a bunch of evading aliens. So, um, that's really great. I hope you really enjoyed those questions. We're going to see some more of these later on based on the content that you're going to hear about. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kickstart tonight's session and it's going to be about competitive materials and those superheroes that will be seen as being bulletproof. So there are many characters that are actually bulletproof. So the first one, or have access to bulletproof powers, is Wonder Woman. So Wonder Woman's uh, bracelets are actually bulletproof. So if you've seen the Wonder Woman film from 2017, she used them as one point to actually stop a bullet. Okay? Another person who's actually bulletproof is Loki. So in the in this opening scene of the Avengers 2012, the film I've seen probably 70 times, he arrives through a, a wormhole, effectively, using the Tesseract. And when he arrives, he encounters a bunch of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who fire at him, and if you look at that scene carefully, you'll see the bullets bounce off his head, and him instantly heal from that particular uh, bullet. So in effect, he actually is also bulletproof. But the characters I want to talk about today are, and refer to mostly through this talk, are Superman and Luke Cage. Now first of all, Superman. Doesn't need much of an introduction, right? Superman, probably everyone's heard of Superman. We've even got our own Superman here tonight. He's right there, look. As if you haven't seen him, no, I don't think some people have seen you yet, Stefano. Can you stand up and show everyone how your Superman costume? Look at that, look. You did a great job. I wouldn't wear, I wouldn't have worn that, but you did, you did it, so well done. Um, so Superman first started in Action Comics number one in June 1938. So this was one of the very first superheroes. I won't say he was the first superhero, there were all the characters and other publications before that. And 
the actor who's been, well, the actor's changed over the years, and he's appeared in a number of films, but I'm going to refer mainly to the, the Netflix series Supergirl. So in Supergirl, you have Superman, and Superman's played by the actor Tyler Hecklin, um, who's another actor taking on that role. Now, Supergirl, if you're wondering, first appeared in Action Comics number 252 in 1959. And there's also a super dog, whose dog, uh, the, the name I don't remember, and there's also a baby. So it's all, take the name, uh, does someone know the name of the dog? Crypto. I, it's Crypto, that's exactly it, yeah, nice. There is a dog that wears a super, super person costume uh, called Crypto, who has superpowers. Yeah, believe it or not. Now the second one we're going to talk about, maybe someone who you're not really familiar with, and this is Luke Cage. So Luke Cage first appeared in Marvel Comics in Luke Cage, a hero for hire, in June 1972, that's issue number one. Now, his powers include superhuman strength, he's also got um, increased stamina, but the thing we're interested in here is that he's impenetrable, he's got bulletproof material. So just to do kind of a, a quick kind of survey here, the uh, character you see on the right-hand side of the slide, that is Luke Cage from the Netflix series, Luke Cage, he's also appeared in The Defenders and in Jessica Jones. Hands up here who's seen any of those series with Luke Cage in it. That's okay. That's okay, so we, I will refer a little bit in my talk anyway to Luke Cage, and then afterwards it will veer into Superman and other characters. So they're the two characters predominantly we're going to talk about, and tonight's topics, well, they're going to range looking at, for example, advanced materials, and then it's going to go on and think about, well, what's another innovative way from, from the biological world we could create impenetrable materials, and then finally to think about how impenetrable materials could have a positive impact on society, and that's what I, along with the other speakers, are going to talk about. Now, today is uh, the first of, first issue of this, or the first episode, and for this, I'm going to be the first speaker, and in all the other episodes, I won't be the first speaker, I'll literally just be the MC, I'll just be the moderator for the whole event. So, here's my talk. Now, this talk, I normally present as part of a series that I call Secrets of Superhero Science, and I'm going to take this part particular subject that I've expanded it out to talk about impenetrability and bulletproof materials. I really want this to happen and, and I, I'm very lucky to have someone on, on stage who's actually done this, is living the dream, in my dream anyway, in terms of in pursuing this um, in, to some degree. And what I'm going to talk about then is kind of hypothetically how this could actually be done in other ways. So we have a number of different bulletproof people in the superhero comic books and superhero literature. You've got the alien, you've got Kal-El of Krypton, Clark Kent, Superman. You've got the human, that's Luke Cage of Harlem, single A, not like the Dutch uh, Harlem. I, when I was writing the slides, I had it as double A. And I'm living here seven years, so um, it's kind of force of habit. Now, you could make the argument about Luke Cage that he's no longer human after what the treatment that he underwent, but he starts out as a human. That's the, what I'm gonna say from the outset. And this guy, I love this guy. This is Colossus from the X-Men, he is a mutant. And his power is, he's also impenetrable, but in a different way. And what, has anyone seen here the Deadpool films? You know, yeah, a lot of people have seen the Deadpool films. So this guy is like the morally correct, ethically correct person who's always there beside Deadpool and being the good angel and telling him what he shouldn't do and what he should do. And invariably Deadpool never listens. But this character's power is quite, quite unique, but also connected to Luke Cage and to Superman. Now, the thing with all three of these characters is that their power, well, it has to come from what, effectively what's going on the outside of their body and everything is skin deep. So it all starts with the skin. So this is just an illustration of the skin. This is probably the most technical figure you're going to see in my presentation. So all I'm going to point out here from this is that you have three layers of the skin. You've got the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. The hypodermis connects to the, the, connect, um, to the muscles and other tissue below, below that. And the epidermis and the dermis, then it can be seen as the predominantly the main parts of the skin. And this, really, this diagram is to scale. The epidermis can be quite thin in places, about 60 micrometers, while the dermis can be up to two millimeters in thickness. And that's all I want you to take away from that particular image. Ignore all the stuff about um, the, fo the follicles. There is one other thing I think I'd like to take away, actually, and that is the sweat glands, because they're really important. We use, we use sweat glands to help us to thermoregulate. So when you're doing exercise, it allows for fluid to leave your skin, reaches the surface, and where there, there it's evaporated, so it's to get, get rid of some of the excess heat in your body. I'm gonna talk about that being a problem for the characters later on. Now, if you wanna see the skin and take an image, that was an illustration. This is another way I've seen the skin. This is an optical coherence tomography image. 
OCT is literally just ultrasound used in medical applications. It allows you to see through the skin to a certain depth, and then it gives you an idea of, well, what's going on when you can see through particular layers. And what I've marked on this particular image is the epidermis and the dermis, and I've also marked the sweat duct as well, and the top of the skin, the stratum corneum, or the top layer of the skin. <coughs> the only things I want you to take, uh, take away from that is the skin is pretty thin. It's about two millimeters, and there are sweat ducts. As I said, that's important later on. Now, let's think about material options. Now, I'm going to go back and talk about Colossus for a moment. Although he's not the main focus of this, you will see that it all connects in the end. Superman was called the Man of Steel back in, in the 30s and 40s. And when Colossus was developed in the 1970s, they decided to give him a power that allows him to create a layer of organic steel on his skin. So it's like one of those rules uh, that comic book writers have to follow in science. It's not a rule. They don't have to follow any scientific rules in the past, that is. What you see in now with the films, particularly in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is that they do follow rules. So, for example, I spoke to the guy who was the consultant for quantum physics on Infinity War and in Endgame. So I spoke to that guy at a conference last year. So I just said to him straight out, did you work on Infinity War? Did you work on Endgame? The answer is yes. Therefore, I know that quantum physics is going to play a part at some point in the story. Now, they're doing that now. But back in the 70s, when Len Ryan came up with the character of, of Colossus, he said, you know what? I'm just going to take two words, organic and steel, put them together, and that's the secret to his power. That's what he creates on his, that's what his skin is. That silver layer you see there is steel. It's kind of like in Back to the Future when they came up with the flux capacitor. They took the word flux capacitor, stick them together, and you get yourself something that doesn't exist and something that everyone wants. I don't have it, by the way, and I don't know anyone who can make it. Um, so that's, that's the, where I'm coming from this. You have this Colossus with his skin. It's organic steel. Great. Works in the comic books. But would it work in reality? Yeah, well, probably not. So here's the reason. This is the human body. This is the breakdown of the percentages of the different elements that you find in the human body. The ones to keep note of there are hydrogen and oxygen, of course, because we're actually, we're actually made of 70% of water, so it's important to keep that in mind. Carbon, keep that in mind as well for later on, because I'll talk about it. And what I did was, last year I wrote a paper about this, about Colossus, and about his skin. And I figured out how his skin could work. This is a paper published in, in Advances of Physiology Education. This is a real journal. This isn't some sort of journal I made up. It's not one of those journals that's asking you to send papers to them. Uh, who's an academic here who gets emails all the time from like making up journals asking for free papers? Yeah? Now I'm sick of them. What was the la latest one I got was the Journal of Digestion Science and Stomach Biology. I mean, <laughs> I don't work in that area. And why would I want to give them a paper? on that area, I mean, I have no idea what that area is, it's obviously a fake journal. This is a real journal, 100%, and in this paper, I document a lot of details about Colossus and his skin. The thing that I'm going to point out first of all here is that our body has about 4 grams of iron, that's about 0.00005% iron, that's assuming if someone has a mass of about 80 kilograms, Colossus is bigger, but let's just say that's, that's, that's what it is. So I've done the calculation. Making a bunch of assumptions, you can check it out in the paper. I figured out that to cover the skin of Colossus, you need 25 kilograms of iron. Now, last time I checked, he is not a fusion reactor. He can't make iron, just produce it himself. So he's, he's at an impasse here. He's got a little bit of a problem. It can't be steel at all. No way. But it can be something else that's in his body. Now, I'm going to tell you what that is in a moment, but I'm going to present the other problem that could be with steel. It'll stop him from thermoregulating. So this is a guy, he's been out running, and he's been sweating, and the sweat's been coming through his skin, and it evaporates and gets rid of all the excess heat in his body and allows his body to reach a homeostasis again after being exercised. Now imagine if you cover a whole lot of that in steel, stop all the fluids from getting out. Then you might actually negatively affect your body's ability to safely thermoregulate. And that means that once your body passes about 42 degrees Celsius, you're in a little bit of problem, a little bit of trouble, because now suddenly pathways start to fail, protein, proteins start to, to behave in ways that they shouldn't behave, and you're actually in danger of your life. And that's what you don't want to do. So if, if Colossus' skin is covered in organic steel, he's a dead man walking. Absolutely. Because, you know, he's doing all this exercise to fight villains, so if he's doing all that, he's using energy. The solution? Christmas. Sweet Christmas. Sweet Christmas. 
Sweet Christmas. <laughs> sweet Christmas. For those who haven't seen Luke Cage, his favorite saying is Sweet Christmas. So you can see he's, he's openly shocked by this revelation. Well, this could be a massive problem for Luke Cage and for Colossus. Uh, so the solution, well, it's already inside his body and it's graphene. Your body is made of about 18.5% carbon. Carbon is made of graphene atoms. It's just a single layer of carbon atoms arranged in this very nice lattice structure and it's one atom thick. And the thing about graphene, it is a monumental material. It is capable of so many applications. It has so many amazing properties. Great electrical conductor, really strong. Um, it's transparent. You know, it's, it's ticking a lot of boxes for me here, I gotta say, in terms of what it could do for impenetrability, impenetrability and impenetrable materials. So, let's look a little bit more at graphene. This is one of the guys behind it. This is Andre Gein, won the Nobel Prize 2010 for graphene, um, along with one of his colleagues. Now, he has been doing inventive science for years. In actual fact, how he was able to come up with a method of isolating graphene from graphite, because graphite is layers of this graphene on top of each other. He's, he went to the laboratory, he used to call it Friday afternoon experiments. They took sticky tape, scotch tape, started peeling scotch, scotch tape off, uh, off the graphite until they got a, a small or thin enough layer which looked like it was potentially um, a single layer, layer of graphene thick, and they did it again until they got the graphene layer. That's what they did. That's how they did it. That was the Nobel Prize in, in, in physics for graphene, 2010. But this guy, he's always thinking outside the box. So he also won the Ig Nobel Prize in physics. That's the joke physics prize, kind of in practical applications in 2001 because he levitated frogs in magnetic fields. You know, just to, just to see if he could, and he did, which is great, awesome. But his best, his greatest collaboration ever is not with frogs and it's not with graphene. It's this, because this is a paper published in a real journal. And if you look at the second author, it's actually his hamster. H-A-M-S Tur Tisha. Hamster Tisha has published a paper with a Nobel winning physicist, Nobel Prize winning physicist. This paper has been cited 12 times. 12 times. This paper is more, some, more citations than some of my papers. And, and if you look on, on Google Scholar, it says it's 23, so it's definitely more than some of my papers. Ham this hamster is prolific in the publishing world. One paper, wow, double digits for um, citations. So you can just get an idea of where he was coming from with his experiments that he was always thinking. He thinks outside the box, and then he was thinking outside that box, and he was outside the next one as well. And that's how he got to this graphene. And the thing is, graphene is great. We've got to figure out a way how to um, apply it. You know, in the real world, people are thinking about, oh, let's use it in foldable mobile phones, or let's use it in advanced uh, technologies that you, know, you can bend and use in different ways. All sounds fantastic. But what I'm more interested in is how the body would actually make graphene. So here's my proposal of how, it, how, the, how your body can make graphene, how, how Colossus would make graphene, or in fact, Luke Cage. So the DNA has been, has been modified. They contain in their DNA the details to make a particular protein. I'm gonna call it the graphene, biographene protein, uh, or biographene gene. That then is expressed, which is basically another way of saying that the body decides, I'm gonna make you, goes to make it, folds it into this very nice protein. These proteins then start to self-assemble into a hexagonal structure, like the one you saw in the picture, which then migrates up to the upper layer of your skin, up to your extracting corneum or up into the epidermis, and there you have your single layer thick graphene in your body, and that all around your body, making you impenetrable. Now there's a load of um, biological shortcuts I've just taken there in that explanation, but that's my proposal for how you could actually do it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about some of the details of why I think graphene is actually good for Colossus or for Luke Cage. So you might also be wondering, is it actually possible for the body to make a lattice inside its body? Because that's a very regular lattice. And in nature, you probably wonder, are there examples of that? And there actually are. So this is a black, uh, uh, sorry, a panther chameleon. And this chameleon is able to change its colors using nanocrystals. And when they actually analyze these nanocrystals, these, these nanocrystals are arranged in a regular lattice underneath their skin. So I, I already know that the natural world can actually do this. Why can't we do it? 
this is another species, has been programmed or has the genes to be able to do it. Now, it would involve a lot of genetic engineering, which is an ethical minefield, which I shall not get into until the next talk, the next episode of Binge Watch Academy. Um, but I think it's possible. Um, I'm going to say that because I can, because I can just start going what is here I'll during, my, during my part. Um, now, the thing about graphene is that it actually would help them to thermoregulate. So this is a, a paper published in Nature Technology, Nanotechnology. And what they actually showed is that um, graphene layers can be used to separate water from salt. That sounds really good, right? So imagine if you've got graphene layer all around your body, you would allow water to pass through your body, pass through your, the, the graphene layer, making sure that you can still maintain sweating and still could thermoregulate in that way. But it also would prevent the loss of key electrolytes, like Na and Cl, which could be used in particular functions for your body. So I think that this is another huge advantage of having graphene layer around your body, that it actually would help you to thermoregulate. So the organic steel is losing out here big time. And one of the other things that I noticed was this. So if you look at this image of Colossus, he has organic steel over his eyes. I always wondered, how does he see? His eyes are covered, right? So you would intuitively think that if your eyes are covered by steel, that you're not going to be able to see. So this is a real paper, where um, a real study, um, where they looked at developing contact lenses from graphene. And this is basically to uh, place over someone's eye. Obviously, you want to probably increase or augment or normalize someone's sight. But it also would protect the wearer's eyes from exposure to increased radiation or other electromagnetic sources. So it would actually, actually protect the eye. So if you look at that image of Colossus there eating his breakfast, Looking out through organic steel or looking through graphene, uh, my, my, uh, my money is more on the fact that I think he's looking out through one of these graphene uh, films, which is, as I say, very, very thin and only an atom of carbon thick. And this is the best part. Now, I wanted to show another image here, but I decided not to because I thought I might disgust people a little bit. Anyone here afraid of snakes? I really wanted to put a snake image up here, but I thought I'd better be PC and not put a snake image. So the idea is that you put this, you have this layer of graphene around your body. And when you're done with it, you shed it, just like a snake sheds their skin, just like we do. And then the next layer comes up and takes over and takes its place. But this process could be happening so fast that you don't see it, and you're only losing a carbon atom uh, thick all the way around instead of 25 kilograms of steel. Sweet Christmas. Sweet Christmas. Sweet Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> Sweet Christmas. He's pretty impressed. <laughs> I've, I've definitely got him on board anyway. So, graphene, is this the secret to being bulletproof? Absolutely. 100%. So, other stuff I haven't told you about, a group in the US have tested graphene against Kevlar and steel and found that graphene outperforms them. And it's a better material potentially to be used as a bulletproof material in the future. So, I, for one, am definitely all about graphene for this application. And perhaps we should call this guy Man of Graphene instead of Man of Steel, because Superman as the Man of Steel, well, I've just told you that steel probably is the best option. Graphene is definitely better. Well, maybe we should go with that for his name instead. So there you go. Has anybody questions for me on my talk before I move on to the next speaker? Yes, we have a catch box, by the way. So we can do this. Are you ready? Oh, way over. <laughs> I should definitely not play American football. <laughs> uh, hello? Yeah, just talk. Yeah. Okay. I have one question. Yes. Like regarding the graphene allowing water to pass through. Yeah. Now, the thing is, when we perspire, we sweat not just water, like many other chemicals, which uh, in increased concentration of in the blood could cause maybe liver and kidney damage for over a repeated period of time. Now, if you're suggesting a graphene skin or something, and if it allows only water to pass through, then won't that increase, uh, you know, urea and urine concentration in the blood that might cause, you know, internal damage to all, all the organs responsible for filtering that out? Absolutely, totally agree with you. <laughs> I have no, I, I totally agree with that comment. It's a very, it's a very valid point. You do, I'm up here doing the what if, so I, you're absolutely right. But it's about finding the right balance. It's about, I think, if, you're, if this was going to become a reality, let's be honest, it's not it's real. Like, it's not real yet. Repeated, like, 
maybe half an hour continuous exertion, you lose a lot of water, but that increases your salt concentration in the blood and that kind. No, no, that is not helpful. That's not healthy. No, not at all. But imagine if you are an endurance runner who is running marathons and you're continually taking on fluid and you're making sure that any lost fluid, that's just water, you're replacing it. But um, perhaps, and I know, I know this because I've done a couple of marathons, I've totally mismanaged my electrolytes and gone boom, down. Ended up with the Red Cross tent after it. So I would love if I didn't have to think so, so difficult about, I think so much, so much about that. Imagine if I was wearing a suit that actually could help me to, to retain my electrolyte balance. But at the same time, it's to me to make sure I drink enough water. So actually these guys, should be, he should be carrying around a big, big gallon of water whenever he's fighting anyway. Yes? Way better than, well, definitely better than me. Yes? Hey, so well, yeah, I'm gonna move towards that question on the same line, but more on the nerdy side. Uh, have you read Dune? No. Okay, there you will see it's like a uh, planet covered of um, sand and deserts and wastelands and stuff. And they're using some suits practically that they can recycle uh, the locals, the Fremen as they're called, they can recycle like the water and even their philosophy of their tribe is like sacred, the water of one person and even in their funerals they do not like uh, cremate or bury their bodies okay. but they get all the water out. So it's already in the literature. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So this could be it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Nice, nice comments. Uh, right, so we're going to move on to the next part, and I'm just going to. Oh, you've got very quick, very, very quickly. Very quick. Um, why would you want to shed your uh, graphene? Because it, because it could get fractured or broken. I mean, it's bulletproof, but it's also susceptible to damage. So you want to have a fresh layer put around the body all the time, so you can replenish it the same way our body replenishes our skin if we get dam gets damaged. We'll take your discussion maybe at the end. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm going to do another question. We're going to do another voting question very quickly. So, um, the question basically is, do you think graphene could be used to create a bulletproof suit? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. So you can sit in the fence completely on this. Again, it's a different, uh, different link to vote on the question, just to make sure of that. And if anyone has voted, please tell me, so I know if I have to go back and reload it. You voted? Yeah, so it hasn't come up, right. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> okay, I'll have to do another reload on this just to see where it comes up, because this is a quick one. Okay, I'll do one more quick reload. I, should, I think I should sell cars. I'm gonna leave it at that. I should sell. I should sell cars. I've convinced everyone in the room here. Well, okay, there's three people know, and then those 13 who are not sure, who are in between, I'll get you over to my side as well. So no problem. The next thing I just briefly want to talk about is Captain Marvel. So that's Captain Marvel. Some people have seen Captain Marvel, right? Great. But that guy is also Captain Marvel. So Captain Marvel was originally a DC character, not Marvel. So we we Brie Larson there as Captain Marvel, and that's Shazam as he's been called now, but originally he was Captain Marvel in the 1940s. He was even more popular than Superman back then, when he was brought up the comic books. And his film is coming out um, in, what, three weeks' time. So I want to show you a really quick clip of what Shazam is all about. Bring it back, I choose you. Say my name so my powers will become yours. Shazam! some of your finest beer, please. Shazam. A lair. Yes. If you have a location like on a cliff, like a castle-esque type thing. Overlooking some water. Overlooking some water. Splashing on rocks and stuff, then we will take that. Experience it in IMAX. That looks really good. I think it looks really clever and um, totally different to the other superhero films that have been coming out of DC. 
So I'm going to introduce our next speaker next. So next speaker has, well, I came across my, the next speaker, even though we live in the same city in Eindhoven, after I wrote the book, and I reference Chilidia's work in the book. So it's, it's, just, it's amazing it's how small a world is, but also that I didn't realize that they were in Eindhoven as well. Now, Chilidia has done some amazing work at the moment. Her current work is on Mystique, which, Mystique, which is on conversion of well, cow manure into clothing. And she's also trying to take that into new and innovative, um, innovative uh, ways and, and, and uh, innovation. But the thing that she's going to talk about today is a project she worked on a few years ago. And, well, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to let uh, Shalidia talk about it. So a round of applause for everyone. Shalidia Saidi from Biowater Laboratories. Thank you, Barry. Um, well, one of my superheroes, Barry. <laughs> um, because I think this is amazing to look at the future and think in possibilities and not in impossibilities. And myself, I uh, are educated as an artist, but I love to work in a crossover of fields. So making use of biotech uh, and nature, looking at nature and creating new things. And what I'm going to tell you about uh, today is bulletproof human skin. And bulletproof human skin, you see the picture here, started as an art project, a project um, which was uh, meant to show the duality of safety in this world. Because on the one hand, um, we have a feeling of safety, and on the other hand, we are dealing with being safe. And to create this, I looked at nature and the beautiful materials nature offers us. Here you see uh, spider silk, and spider silk is material with incredible material properties. It's biodegradable, it's biocompatible with the human body, it's a better heat conductor than copper, and it's 10 times as, steel, as strong as steel. But when you talk about as strong as steel, what are you talking about? Well, in the case of synthetic spider silk, you talk about a combination of material properties. Here you see comparison between Kevlar, the material which is used, for example, in bulletproof vests, and um, spider silk. Well, Kevlar has a high breaking point, but less flexibility than spider silk, which makes spider silk a stronger, a better material. Here you see it's uh, under a microscope, and you see how flexible the material is, and uh, that it has a high breaking point before it breaks. And um, as an artist, I, I uh, like to read uh, articles. And I uh, started uh, reading an article of Dr. Randy Lewis in uh, the United States, which was creating genetically modified goats uh, who are producing synthetic spider silk in the milk. And one of the applications was for a bulletproof vest. Now here you see a picture of uh, three people uh, helping one soldier to put on a bulletproof vest because it's very heavy. Uh, it consists of 30 layers, uh, Kevlar and a ceramic plate, a uh, type 1 bulletproof vest. And of course, this is a very uh, overdone picture, um, but it shows um, that it needs some better and stronger and lighter materials. So, theoretically, they wanted to use the spider silk for bulletproof vests. But I thought, why a bulletproof vest? What if we could create bulletproof humans? Well, ethically, it's not allowed uh, nowhere in the world to create bulletproof humans. So I went to the closest thing uh, to a bulletproof human, and that was an in vitro bulletproof human skin. And to create a bulletproof human skin, uh, you need different stakeholders. You need different fields to collaborate with, because there is no specialist in the world who creates bulletproof skins. So I collaborated with a forensic genomic uh, consortium. They work on uh, forensic research uh, with uh, dermatologists of the Leiden University, with Randy Lewis of Utah State University, and with the, forensic, the Dutch Forensic Institute, because we want to test the skin to take the actual bullet. To create a bulletproof human skin, it's like a recipe. Uh, you need a few ingredients. 
And one of the ingredients is actual human skin. And here you see a piece of skin. It was some leftover skin from plastic surgery. Um, I thought her name was Sarah. She was 47. That's, I think, the amount of information we have about the skin. But from the skin, the fibroblasts and the carinocytes were isolated in some collagen. And um, they were combined with the synthetic spider silk. But the spider silk um, went through a process. Here you see the skin. And as you look at the picture through a microscope, it's, it's incredible. It looks almost like the spider's web. The spider silk uh, went uh, outside of the Netherlands because it was a quite new uh, material and the machines we had in the Netherlands couldn't deal with the spider silk because it was thinner than baby hair. So it traveled to Germany and uh, somewhere uh, east and uh, we got it back and it was weaved in a, in a matrix uh, which was based on how bulletproofs are uh, weaved but flexible enough to uh, withstand the bullet, but with uh, right holes to feed the cells. So the synthetic spider silk, uh, the human skin cells, so the fibroblast, the renocyte, the collagen, grew together in vitro, and um, we took them uh, to the shooting range at the Dutch Forensic Institute. Uh, and all the stakeholders were there because it was quite interesting for the dermatologists because no one ever shot their skin types before. Uh, for the forensic people, this was quite interesting because all the forensic research, uh, if they are testing uh, the effect on bullets, is done on pig skin. Um, so every stakeholder had a part in this and something they like to know about um, bulletproof skin for their own research. So at the Dutch Forensic Institute, um, there was a high-speed camera which recorded the impact of the bullets. And what you see here is uh, pig skin, and pig skin because it's a skin type that comes the closest to our own skin. And as you can see, the bullet goes straight through. This is an in vitro uh, human skin, so the carinocytes, uh, fibroblast, um, the collagen. And all these skin types were attached to a ballistic gel, and ballistic gel was to simulate the human muscle. Uh, this is an in vitro human skin uh, enhanced with uh, silk from a normal silk mud. And as you can see, the bullet goes straight through. And this is the actual skin with four layers of synthetic spider silk and the human skin cells. And as you can see, the bullet doesn't penetrate uh, the skin, uh, but it gets wrapped in the skin. It doesn't mean that you are bulletproof because the impact of a bullet is more than a penetration of skin. You will have a beautiful corpse at the end. Um, so for me, that bulletproof human skin started with my love for nature and especially spiders. I love them. Uh, the spider world is a real female world. The spiders, the female spiders quite big and the males are very small and uh, they have one function and no two function. At the end they get eaten. Um, so I had those uh, beautiful ladies in a lab in Eindhoven and uh, this is the golden orb beaver. They are as big as my hands, the females, and they built incredible three-dimensional golden webs and um, yeah, this material is crazy. But the problem with these ladies is that they are cannibalistic and territorial. If you look at them, to use them in a commercial scale, uh, you need a lot of space and um, they are not that friendly and you need quite a lot of spiders to produce enough to have enough for a society. And that's nothing new. In the 18th century, um, we had uh, spider farms in France and they had these crazy, incredible uh, machines to milk spiders, so they were attached and the spider silk was collected. And this shows the desire we have as a society for these incredible materials. Here you see the golden cape, and uh, to pr produce the golden cape, uh, they had quite a lot of work to do, because they needed to harvest the spiders, to find the spiders, to collect the spider silk, and I believe it was 20 people, four years long, working day in, day out,
collecting the spiders, milking the spiders, working with the silk and weaving it to create one golden cape. And it's also described uh, by the people who wore it as um, a material which is very light, it's as if you are wearing no clothes. It's a very fine material. And this again shows the desire we have as a society to obtain these materials. But like I said, those girls uh, are cannibalistic and territorial and uh, it, it takes quite a lot of work to get the spice silk. So how did I get the spice silk for the bulletproof human skin? Well, that's again another story. A story which also starts with gunpowder, bulletproof vests and spiders. And this story starts with Duma, uh, a big chemical giant which we all know. Um, started in the early days as a gunpowder manufacturer. And uh, by producing this gunpowder, um, they obtained quite a lot of money. And they did crazy things with this money. They had, for example, research uh, where they were shooting golf balls at objects and just testing the material properties um, of this material. And by doing that, they developed uh, new materials by accident, like nylon. And nylon um, was described also in, in all the uh, marketing as smooth and as flexible as spider silk. But also, uh, Kevlar was developed at that time. Kevlar, which is strong and uh, has a high breaking point in comparison with nylon. And this shows again that desire to obtain or to create a material, in this case chemically, to uh, get those properties by the silk offers. Here you see the first attempt in biotech um, in genetically modifying an other organism to produce spider silk. And in this case, it was an E. coli bacteria who could produce the spider silk protein. Well, it's nothing, it's not looking different than any E. coli bacteria, but it has this amazing gift of producing that spider silk protein. Nowadays, we have all kinds of organisms who can produce spider silk. Goats who produce the spider silk in the milk, and through electro spinning, you can spin uh, the proteins into threads and use them, for example, in bulletproof vest. But also silkworms who create a hybrid in their cocoon. And the beauty of uh, all these organisms is that you can make use of existing industries, like the milk industry, uh, the silk industry, so you don't have to create that wheel again. Which makes it possible for us as a society to obtain the material. The beauty of all these organisms, and it's not only goats and uh, silkworms, you also have alfalfa, uh, fungi, um, and I think every year there is being added a new organism that can produce this silk, is that it's tailor-made, because you can play with properties. It's not like uh, wool or cotton. It's a material um, which, you, which you can adjust into uh, the application you wish. And it's nothing new, and it's, it's, and it's not that difficult. It's like playing as a kid with Lego, and then here you see spider silk on molecular level, and like the beta sheets, the blocks, are there for the toughness, and you see the spirals. They are uh, the part for the flexibility, the flexibility of the material. And like I said, it's nothing new. Nature already does this. A spider, produces uh, the golden orb six types of threads and every thread has its own um, goal in this web. For the bulletproof skin we made use of the dragline silk and the dragline silk is the silk which the spider uses to build the skeleton of the web. So it has enough flexibility and a high breaking point and on that silk she puts the other types of silk. For example, flagellia silk Flagelia silk is a very sticky and flexible silk to catch the impact of an insect in the web. If you look closer at it, the MASP2 is the dragline silk which is used and it has enough beta sheets and enough beta spirals to 
give it these amazing properties. Like I said, the tailor is the future is tailor made, and um, by creating a bulletproof human skin, um, I didn't think about all the questions it would raise um, uh, in society because people also start to think, okay, so you are not a scientist, you are an artist, and you are working with science materials which are uh, owned by science. I am working with genetically modified organisms, is this okay? I'm a, I am working with human skin, and using it, it's, it's, it's human, it's part of us, to create a product. I patented the bulletproof skin, I could sell it to the highest bidder, um, even if the goal is only military applications or by uh, someone who only wants to create a skin uh, available in white. So with creating a bulletproof human skin, you get also all these ethical questions. Well, with the bulletproof skin, uh, which started as an art project, is now um, a medical research because the bulletproof human skin is being researched as a, a, a skin craft for people with burn wounds and open wounds because of all these incredible uh, material properties. Like I said in the beginning, biodegradable, biocompatible with the human skin. And by using the silk, the spider silk, as a carrier for skin cells, you can make big pieces, and the pieces are very strong. I think so far, thank you for your attention. If you have any question, let me know. Thank you for your talk. Is there any questions for Shalia? Yes, we have one. Who's got the catch box? Who's thrown? Okay, great. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, nice presentation. I love it. And I want, I want to ask you if you could put up the slide with the diagram for toughness and for Kevlar and um, the spider skin. And I have a question based on that. Yeah. My, I want to see it one more time before I ask it, so I don't sound okay. like letting me guess. <laughs> that one? Uh, yes, one perfect, time. yes. Um, okay, if I am correct, I see here that the spider skin, skin does bend, uh, well, way more faster than Kevlar. Sorry? Uh, the spider skin bends much faster than Kevlar, Yeah, it has, right? a more, it has more flexibility, yeah. Yes. Would it that mean that if you would be able to use spider skin, you would need a much thicker layer to catch a bullet than with Kevlar? Because if it bends, you will reach the skin faster, and then it would hurt even more than Kevlar, if I assume. Yeah, like I said, um, at, at uh, the part with the high-speed camera, you won't be bulletproof um, with, with spider silk in your skin. Um, yes, of course, you need more layers, by, but by adding more layers in your skin, uh, like Barry said, your skin is quite thin, and adding spider silk is not that uh, helpful. No, no. That wouldn't make sense, yeah. Okay, yes. then my question answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from anybody else? We, get, we do get the troll again. Yeah, <laughs> down the back. Uh -oh. Hi. Hi. Uh, you told us that it's more conducting than copper? Like, it's, it's a better heat conductor than, than copper. And does so it they, did compare, they did research and compared uh, the conduction of copper with the conduction of the uh, synthetic spider silk. Yeah, and does it already being used for any purposes or just like um, its own Yeah, there are a few, you, few patents. Uh, some researchers, I think, in the United States are working on that part. Uh, uh, I think with with the goal to use it also in, in, in computer chips and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Shalia, for your great talk. Yeah. We'll move on to the next speaker. A little round of applause for Shalia for the talk. Thank you. Okay, so before we get on to the last set of speakers, it's gonna be three of them together actually. I'm gonna to do um, another one of these questions on what you've just heard about. So get your phones out, we're gonna do some more of the voting. So um Shalidia mentioned earlier on that there's a spider goat, and um, I think the group are going to, the next is going to tell a little bit more about, I call it a spider goat, it's a goat that's been genetically modified to produce the spider silk, and it produces it in the milk. So, the question is, would you drink the milk from the spider goat? 
Absolutely, yes. No way, or let me have a think about that. I think people are answering, so I think this thing is operating automatically. Oh. Interesting. With 24, we'll do it again. 42. Wow. Are you looking at this? Really? Yeah. Yeah, uh, one more, we'll do one more. It's, it's, it's protein. It's protein in the milk, it's not like the threads. It has to be taken out of the milk and extra sponge. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like a protein in the milk. It's protein in the milk. Milk is protein. Yeah, so most people here are no way on drinking, <laughs> drinking it. It's perfectly safe. It's just a protein. It's not toxic. Um, why would you put it in your body? It's, bi it's biocompatible. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good way around it. Yeah. Okay. You could, say, but you could argue that spider silk is a plant because it's normally found on. I'm I'm clutching at straws here, but you could argue it's like a plant that's put on trees and stuff. No. No. We'll take a question uh, at the end. If it's okay, just to move through the the rest. Thanks. Um, okay. So just speaking of spider silk, because. Obviously, when you talk about spider silk, you think of this guy, Spider-Man, and there have been three Spider-Mans, and let's just see one of the Spider-Men doing their thing. Listen, Peter. You did good, but this does not mean you're an Avenger. Mr. Stark is treating me like a kid. But you are a kid. Don't mess with me, because I will kill you and everybody you love. I have to catch this guy, and nothing's gonna stop me. Parker, my office. So, you got detention. How are you gonna make things right? Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, of course, that's the last Spider-Man um, that was out in 2017, but I don't have a short clip for, excuse me, the latest Spider-Man, which is gonna be Spider-Man Far From Home. Maybe in the later episodes, I will show you a clip from that film. So we're on to the last speakers, or group of speakers. So I had the, pr the privilege of actually working with these three speakers on a project over 20 weeks here at TU Delft. They're all part of a, we're taking part in a minor and responsible innovation, which is a collaboration between Leiden, Erasmus Rotterdam, and TU Delft. And I gotta say, I had great fun working on the project, and they're gonna tell you all about their work. So I want to introduce to everyone, Lee, Jeanette, and Max, who are gonna tell you all about what they worked on. You to go there. Over here, and I'll give you that. And you were off. Just pressing that one to go forward. Okay. Uh, so now you know all these amazing possibilities of spider silk. It's also another really cool thing that you can do with spider silk, namely spider silk seam graphs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Lei, and together with Jeanette and Max, we're going to inform you about um, our case study for spider silk in healthcare. Okay, so first let me mention this. Spider silk is not yet being used in healthcare. Oh, well, we'll let you think it should be. Okay. Uh, so let's recall its properties. Um, as Jalila mentioned before, uh, spider silk is, uh, has got high tensile strength, so, oh, <laughs> um, and it uh, has high el uh, elasticity. Um, it's also biodegradable, and above all, it's also biocompatible, so compatible with biomaterial, for example, your body. Okay, so um, with these, um, due to these properties, it has great potential in a lot of applications. Um, the one that you might think of is in the military because of its bulletproof uh, property. And um, another one is in the aviation industry because uh, you can use spider silk to build really lightweighted, high-performance airplanes. So that's great and all. However, we are going to use it for a more responsible application, which is in healthcare. So uh, also I have to mention that uh, our case study is uh, inspired in part by uh, Jelina's views uh, of the medical application of spider silk. Uh, but before getting into healthcare, we're going to take a step back. Um, how is it being produced? Well, let me repeat some uh, things. Uh, Renny Lewis, a professor at the 
Utah State University has genetically modified a goat to produce milk, which contains spider silk proteins. So extract these proteins and then you can make your own spider silk. Yeah, but wait, um, why not just use spiders? We have spider silk. Well, as said before, they're territorial and cannibalistic, so putting up spider farms isn't a really good idea. Okay, so let's go with the goats. Um, however, is it, uh, is it okay to genetic modify an animal for this? Is it, is it wrong to um, do this for our own purpose? Well, to answer these questions, we've taken a look at a lot of ethics. Uh, so ethics, a discipline uh, which deals with uh, what's right and wrong, simply said. And we've come to the conclusion that we really should use bacteria for the long term as a production method for spider silk. Um, no spiders, no goats, no animal involvement at all, uh, and has way less ethical issues. So, um, yeah, even though this production method is uh, technically limited on the long term, after some more research, I'm sure it can work out great. Okay, so that's it for the production part, and for the actual application, I'll give the stage to Jeanette. Thank you. Uh, do you just press the timer? Yeah. Okay, so before uh, moving into the application uh, of spider silk skin grafts, actually, we're going to take a closer look at how conventional uh, skin graft methods work. So at the moment, uh, the most common method is by taking, uh, well, it involves two quite uh, intrusive procedures. So the first one is where you remove a part of healthy skin. Usually it's from the hips or from the upper leg, somewhere not very visible, and you um, mesh that, which is you cut it into, uh, well, as you see in the image, to enlarge the area it could cover, and then you either uh, suture it or surgically stitch it on top of the wound. Um, now, uh, another method is by um, incorporating in vitro skin. So you would have to take uh, a little bit of tissue of the patient, and then you could grow a piece of skin in the lab. However, the limitation of this is that it takes a lot of time to uh, actually grow a piece of skin. Like, we spoke to a medical practitioner, it would at least take two weeks, which is quite a lot if you're in high need of a piece of skin. Um, so this is where actually spider silk could uh, come into play because you could pre-produce um, that and then uh, you can use that as a scaffold for the, the um, cultured skin to strengthen it and then place it on top of the wound. Now, um, oh, sorry. Um, the, uh, a few limitations of the uh, application of spider silk would be, um, as it is a scarce material, uh, it's distributive justice. So for instance, how would you distribute this material as it is quite expensive? Would it create a barrier between the rich and the poor? or would it be, uh, become a tool for just the rich to use? Uh, another factor is uh, the uh, uh, informed consent, which is currently um, a document you have to fill in uh, to, before undergoing a procedure. So you're actually giving uh, consent to the practitioner to uh, perform this uh, surgery on you. Uh, for spider silk, you would need an entirely new uh, informed consent document, which takes up all the ins and out of the procedure. Um, another issue we looked into is the uh, matter of cultural context. So we did a case study on three regions, uh, the Middle East, Eastern Asia, and the West. And what we noticed is that there is a great um, difference in the notion of illness. So for instance, the West, it sees the uh, illness as uh, abnorm uh, bodily abnormalities, whereas in uh, the Eastern Asia, they see it as a um, uh, like disharmony between the body, the soul, and the environment. Uh, secondly, there in the West, there is uh, a great focus put on autonomous right, whereas in the uh, Eastern Asia and in the Middle East, they uh, take um, opinions of family and of friends and close ones into high regard. Now, despite these limitations, the benefits of spider silk are undeniable. Its great uh, biodegradability and its biocompatibility would make it a great uh, candidate for uh, a replacement material for skin grafts. 
queue. So before we can implement uh, uh, SpiderSilk in healthcare, we need to have open-minded conversations about the material so we can share ideas and thoughts, and this will help for the development of the material. Also, it's important to educate people so they get to know the facts, uh, because people uh, fear what they don't know. <clears throat> science communication is any form of communication about science. That uh, means uh, communication from the scientist to the public, but also from the public to the scientist. The scientists can use uh, science communication to promote their research, and, to, uh, and they can make their research sound more fun than it actually is. And also, uh, it is a tool to make it easier to understand for laymen. Um, scientists uh, often use papers or articles or documentaries to communicate their research, but uh, last year's social media has grown and it has a big influence on uh, science communication. Uh, research has shown that uh, an article that is tweeted about is 11 times more likely to get cited. So that's, uh, that shows that it's really important uh, to spread research for, uh, on social media for researchers. Um, we uh, also uh, contributed to science communication uh, of our project. Um, we had an article in, in the TU Delta on the website. Uh, we went to BioArt Laboratories to have a presentation there. Uh, we did a survey, we spoke a lot of uh, experts, and we're also going to publish a paper in the uh, Journal of Barry called Superhero Science and Technology. And this is a result from the survey that we did. Uh, on the left, you see the results from the questions if people would accept an artificial uh, skin graft from spider silk. And on the right, uh, the question, the results from the question, if GMOs, so genetically modified organisms, should be used in healthcare. And what most people don't know is that uh, spider silk is made with GMOs. So on the left, you see that 85% indirectly says that they would uh, accept GMOs. And on the right, just 69% uh, would accept it. So the way you uh, communicate the science to the public uh, affects the uh, opinion of the people. So that uh, shows how important, how important it is to communicate the science well. And uh, now the spider silk in healthcare is just a case study. Um, but maybe in the future uh, we can actually use it in healthcare. And maybe the next step is uh, actually impenetrable skin. But before we uh, we use it. Uh, we have to do this. We have to innovate it responsibly, and we have to keep all uh, stakeholders happy and, and safe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. The next slide, I think, is your question slide, right? Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for the students? They did an awesome job with the project. I have to say, it was a pri as I say, a privilege to work with them on the project. I'm going to say that again, it really was. They were so energetic, enthusiastic with it, and they brought loads of great ideas, so I, was, I couldn't be happier with what they did and achieved in the project. So yes, you have the box. Go. <laughs> Hi. Uh, How are you doing? I don't know if it's for the students or in general. Uh, I see that in most of your slides you try to compare it with uh, steel or copper, I don't know. Uh, but in terms of uh, cost of production, like, what do you say? Like, I know that the strength is amazing and the elongation, as you say, but do you have some comments about the cost of production? Uh, yeah, the production is uh, really uh, small scale now, so it's really hard to produce large amounts of spider silk, and therefore it's really expensive. So uh, in that field, it cannot compete with uh, common uh, materials like steel. So. Yeah. Thank you for the question. It's great. Yeah, we're going to throw it. Catch it. Very easy question. Uh, yeah. What was the minor called? Responsible innovation. Responsible innovation. Yeah. Responsible innovation. <laughs> 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 Any other quick, uh, qu one more quick question? Yeah, we got down in the middle, so here we go. Do better than I did the last time. Oh, well, brilliant. <laughs> That's the best one of the night. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I have a lot of questions, but this, um, 
did you meet some immunological problems with rejection? No, because uh, one of the properties of spire silk is that it's uh, biocompatible. So um, when you put this spire silk skin graft on your skin, then your body just accepts it and um, due to its biodegradability, it eventually disappears. So yes, it accepts it. What I actually miss is uh, where do you actually use the other specific properties of this spire uh, silk? That means it's flexible, it's strong, it's light. Um, or maybe this is for a prospect. I can see where you can use these properties is, for example, uh, in the big vessels, high pressure, it's flexible. Okay, maybe this is just the start. Uh, so, uh, I think you mean why would you use? Yes, spider yes. Silk what's for actually healthcare? what's actually the the starting point to use the spider silk uh, for skin grafts? I would say using the specific properties, I would uh, uh, think of another field to apply it in uh, human skin, and it's, for example, for big vessels, um, arteries. Go on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, there are actually a few reasons. So, as I mentioned, um, currently they are also already uh, using um, lab-cultured uh, skin. Uh, however, that is, it takes a lot of time to uh, grow a thick layer, which you need for the sturdiness. So um, using or integrating spider silk would actually contribute to its strength. And as it is very flexible, it kind of mimics the, the texture of the skin because you don't want something that's just as hard as steel doesn't allow it to move at all. And also because it's uh, biodegradable, you wouldn't need an additional um, surgery to, for instance, remove a covering or whatever, a synthetic covering. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We'll take, well, actually we won't, sorry. What we're gonna do is we're oh. just gonna, <laughs> well, actually we might take that question a second. We'll get everyone to sit down again. Okay. That'd be great, thanks very much. <laughs> we you. did really well, thanks a lot. So, I know we're running a little bit high schedule, but because this is a talk show and we're all on seats and stage, I wanna pretend I'm in a talk show, okay? So I'm gonna pretend for two minutes that I'm a host of a talk show. Hopefully it'll be longer than the other sessions. So I wanna say thank you very much for everyone speaking. Um, so I'm going to ask you just just because I'm uh, want superpowers and I want them tomorrow or y yesterday actually. Do you think that any of the things that you've spoken about today would actually really happen? For example, a bulletproof person ever in the future with spider silk? With a combination of uh, materials. It could be with a combination yeah. of materials. But would we need a bulletproof human in the future? That's absolutely true. And sh or sh and should we have it? Yeah. How about when, from your work? So I, I, one thing I want to ask you is that when you told your friends and family you were working on a project about using spider silk and skin grafts, what was their reaction? Well, there, uh, some of them are actually sitting here. <laughs> yeah. And they've also done the survey. Uh, yeah, all of them just said, yeah, it's okay to um, apply the spider silk skin grafts if it's there, if it's required. So I think it's also um, because it's my close group that bit of uh, open-minded people will also study at the tier delt. That's true, so yeah. Did you, Jeanette, did you encounter anyone who, who um, resisted it? For me, it's actually similar. Well, but uh, usually upon explaining, then most people would be like, oh yeah, I would accept that. But for instance, one of our um, yeah, group mates who was working with us during the first quarter, he was really afraid of spiders. So, oh yeah, <laughs> do you remember? Yeah. And Gino. then, um, so at the beginning of uh, our project, we hadn't set yet on spider silk skin grass, but we were kind of looking into it, and he was like, oh, no, no way I would accept that because it's made out of spider silk, and he had this crazy fear of spiders. Does he know how much spiders he consumes every year in his sleep? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't told him that. Best, best not, best not, best leave that detail, <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. And, and Max, for you, did you have, like, what's your viewpoint after being in the project compared to what, you, what your viewpoint was before? Um, I, in the beginning, I didn't really thought that uh, spider silk could be uh, beneficial in healthcare because it's uh, so expensive, but um, it has some, uh, the material is so promising that it, it, it's better than uh, other materials. And uh, what I think is really, uh, uh, but the big benefit is that you don't have to cut a piece of skin uh, from your leg, so uh, you have less scars. That, yeah, it would still be more expensive, but 
yeah, I think it's more beneficial. So would I be right in saying that all four, actually all five of us on stage, would accept a spider silk skin graft if we were yeah. given the option and it was a viable healthcare option in the future? Yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes, There's, that, that's great because that actually leads into the question I want to ask everybody <laughs> because I want to know if you would actually accept, this is more data for our uh, survey, <laughs> so would you accept an artificial skin graft that is made from spider silk? There's the link again, it's a different link, that's a zero at the start. Um, yes, no, mm, let me think about it. And we're getting the answers live on this one. I like this, it's great watching the results going through. Wow. <laughs> oh, there's a, and there's a no. <laughs> that aligns with what, we, what you saw in your survey. Yeah. It really does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, kind of the same results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of looks quite similar, yeah. the numbers. Yeah, we got 47, I think there might be might be, that might be it. So that's pretty clear cut, isn't it? Ah, there we go. 36 yeses, three noes, and nine, mm, let me think about it. Okay, not gonna single out anyone. If any of the noes want to tell me why, could you? It's okay if you don't want to. If you don't, that'd be great if you could. Hello, yeah. Uh, can hear um, you. I think it's a really great idea, but you know, you guys say that it's biodegradable, right? Yes. So I was just wondering, so it probably becomes degraded as maybe fibers and then goes into the bloodstream. And wouldn't that mean that there will be coagulation and that could cause thrombosis? Do you want to address that? Because I could, but I'll leave it to you. Well, the in vitro skin doesn't has to be uh, the, the uh, spider silk doesn't needs to be uh, go go through that process by electro spinning and weaving it. You can use the proteins directly and make a mesh out of it. So you skip the whole fiber part. So how would it, uh, what happens to it when it gets uh, degraded? Like just like it's it's dust. like uh, if you have a tattoo or something. It it's. Uh, moves in the body and uh, there is no research yet uh, <laughs> where it goes through and but but your own body is trying to get rid of it okay i could reconsider there you go <laughs> yeah. so if we voted again you'd vote yes <laughs> great the other two people could talk to me later we'll, we'll convince you as well i'm joking uh this isn't about everyone's opinion is valid and it's good to see that there's a spectrum of people with yeses and noes Right, um, we just did a little bit of a discussion, but I will ask, uh, so we had a little bit of talk, I'm going to invite maybe one more question from the audience before I conclude. Does anyone else have any questions or comments they want to say about the first episode of Binge Watch Academy? Anybody have anything? Someone has the catch box, do you want to use it? There's just behind you, just, just, the, yeah, they were just first, just in ahead of you. Uh, hi, I hi. have a question. Like, yes. Why does Superman need a suit if... His skin is bulletproof, like his graphene. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, that's the question. So, so I was doing all my research on this, and those have seen, you've seen Luke Cage? So when Luke Cage gets shot, the bullets go through his clothes and damage his clothes. But when Superman's suit is shot, seemingly it doesn't get damaged at all. It's perfect. So are you thinking that Superman should just fly around in, like, the minimum? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> is that okay? Right? Okay. That's a point, yeah, yeah. Valid, valid point. Oh, not that doesn't appeal to me, but maybe it appeals to you. So Henry Cavill running around in his underwear, <laughs> flying around in his underwear. Sorry, is that it? <laughs> Anybody else got another point or a last question? You have, yeah. Small boy. Sorry. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, yeah, a uh, very small point I wanted to uh, to point out. Something I thought of uh, during the lecture, and that is, if you take Colossus as an example for this experiment. Uh, then you would uh, some, somehow I found out actually that whole, the whole idea of Colossus couldn't work uh, just because he, his lifespan would have been long, not just because all his internal organs would fail, but also his exterior would fail because of due to weather, tear, and rust. Mostly because of rust. Uh, possible, but in the comic books, he's able to turn back and forth in between his organic steel form and his human form, so he's never permanently in his organic steel form. 
And the reason they do it in Deadpool, because it looks better. Yeah. Okay, that would make much more sense. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he does in the comic books. Good point. That's what I like. I like this out-of-the-box thinking. Great. Two really good points. So, um, I think I have one more question. I think I do, yeah? Very, very quickly. So, actually, because it's really good. Which material, have, you've heard about a number of them, do you think would be the best option for impenetrable material? So, we have steel, really exists. Graphene, really exists. Spider silk, really is, exists. Vibranium, does not exist. But let's imagine that it did. I think I've opened up, uh, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. Um, come on, be It's a competition between graphene and vibranium. <laughs> Come on, graphene. <laughs> and we may have all of the votes in. Um, okay, so wow, I should not have put graphene in, or vibranium in there. I should have left that one out because it's given people an out to ask for that fictional material which is okay, vibranium is great, it's really cool. As we know, it's more than just a shield. Um, but I'm really happy to see graphene is there, but spider silk, I think that um, has more, more to offer than, uh, than you may think. So we just have to let, let's, let's see what the future may hold for spider silk in terms of innovation. So we're nearly, nearly at the end. And um, I have got to show you something. This. like a thousand years ago I fought my way out of that cave became Iron Man realized I loved you I know I said no more surprises but I was really hoping to pull off one last one the world has changed None of us can go back. All we can do is our best. And sometimes the best that we can do is to start over. I saw all these people die. I keep telling everybody they should move on. Some do, but not us. Even if there's a small chance, we owe this to everyone who's not in this room to try. We will. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I like this one. <laughs> so that trailer is the latest trailer for Avengers Endgame, and that dropped only today. I've got to say that my favorite part of the whole trailer is Rocket on War Machine shoulder. That is awesome. So I'm going to analyze the trailer. I'm going to put a podcast out about that tomorrow or the next day. I'm going to take that trailer apart and do a podcast analysis. And it's going to appear on this podcast series. So what I should point out is the following. You're going to have a podcast coming out after this episode about this episode. So that's going to be a podcast with the speakers and me. And we're going to talk about what we spoke about today and maybe a little bit more things that came up from you as the audience because this is a two-way street. We come with the information, but we want to talk to you and have dialogue with you. 
then there will be another podcast coming out just before episode two. And episode two is going to be focusing on Jessica Jones, who has appeared alongside Luke Cage in The Defenders and on the Netflix series. And we're also going to talk a little bit about and reflect on the X-Men and their mutant powers. So the focus there is going to be in relation to gene genetics, DNA, and lots of different people are going to talk about various aspects. And actually, two of the speakers are sitting right in front of me at the end there, are going to come from the iGEM team here on campus. They're going to talk about their work. I can't, really, I can't wait to hear what they're going to say about that. Um, there's a reminder of the dates for all of the episodes of Binge Watch Academy Superhero Science. I hope you've enjoyed the very first episode of Binge Watch Academy Superhero Science at TU Delft. Um, my name has been Barry Fitzgerald. These have been our marvelous speakers. One more round of applause for speakers. They've been awesome. And I should also point out that two more of the speakers in episode two were actually sitting right in front of me. So there's actually four of the speakers here for the, uh, for the talk in episode two. Um, this has been Binge Watch Academy Superhero Science. I hope you've enjoyed it. Safe trip home. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>